Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. And this is lesson number six in that series for November 6th of 2021, entitled For What Nation Is There So Great? Hmm. We'll see what that's all about. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have gathered together to talk about your will, about the communications you had with your friend Moses. And you had a surprise package for him at the just a short time after he wrote this book. You, even though you let him die because of his sin at the at Kadesh, you resurrected him from the dead and took him to heaven. Wow. What a privilege. Let's try to see if we can figure out what was so special about Moses and about what he wrote as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. In Deuteronomy, we have those four sermons that we've already mentioned. Uh, they were given to the children of Israel, written out and given to them as their camps there at the uh, foot of well, at the foot of Mount Nebo, where Moses died, but across the flooded Jordan River from Jericho that they could see very clearly right across there. And Moses starts out Deuteronomy by giving them a brief summary of, of the history that they've had together. But now as we turn to chapter 4, he turned to give them some very serious instruction based on what had already happened to them. You know, you're, if, if you learn from your mistakes, they're not really mistakes, or they may be mistakes, but at least you've learned something, right? So if you, he's reviewing their history, he says, now, look, at these are the things that happened. Can we do better? And he began with words that mean, so now listen. Let me say that again. So now listen. What's he trying to say to them? Imagine how different the history of our world would be if Israel had taken those words seriously and lived by them. Hmm. Moses was seeking to impress upon them the importance of listening carefully, accepting the message that God was giving them, obeying it, and applying it to their lives on a daily basis. Look at these first words from Deuteronomy 4. Jim? Start at Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 and 2. Then Moses said to the people, Obey all the laws that I am teaching you, and you will live and occupy the land which the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add anything to what I command you, and do not take, away, take anything away. Obey the commands of the Lord, your God, that I have given you, American Bible Society, Holy Bible. Okay, notice the very important instructions, admonishing them not to add anything to what God had commanded, and do not take anything away. Does that remind you of some instructions given at the end of the Bible? Carrie? Mm -hmm. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. That's about, what, three verses from the end or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if anyone takes anything away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from them their share of the fruit of the tree of life and of the holy city, which are described in this book from the Good News Bible. How? Well, but come on now. Who would want to change, take away, or add to God's instructions, his statutes and judgments? Charles, have you heard of anybody like that? I Satan. know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Satan has been persevering and untiring in his efforts to prosecute the work he began in heaven to change the law of God. He has success, succeeded in making the world believe the theory he presented in heaven before his fall, that the law of God was faulty and needed revising. A large part of the professed Christian church, by their attitude, if not by their words, show that they have accepted the same error. Ellen White, Selected Messages, Book 2, 
uh, page 107, paragraph okay, 2. Okay, now, what do we immediately think about when we, when we talk about other churches having changed the laws of God? You know, about 2017, they said there was 45,000 Christian denominations mm. in the world. In 2003, it was about 37,000. I think it was 000. churches, not denominations. No, it was denominations. Denominations. Churches, yes. you can find them in, um, in California. Oh, yeah. No, it's denominations. He's right. That I'm is not making the, the turn. Yeah, right. it, it's Whoa. not making it up. In fact, I might find you, but go ahead. No, we'll, I'll find. If you review the history of the children of Israel through much of the Old Testament, they were ignoring statues that God had given them. But when we come to the New Testament, the Pharisees were intent on adding statues that God had not given, thus making it very difficult for p people to keep all their directions. We've talked about the 613 additions to the Sabbath commandment. Well, what does the Bible say about that? Uh, my, my turn? Okay. Matthew 15, 1 to 9. Then the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came from Jerusalem to Jesus and asked him, Why is it that your disciples disobey the teaching handed down from our ancestors? Don't, they don't wash their hands in the proper way before they eat. Okay, Myra, I'm going to ask you a question. Where does it tell them in the Old Testament how to wash their hands? It's not there. <laughs> Uh, your name's not Myra. <laughs> I was I'm helping us. I, I, I don't remember that, but... It's not there. They had added. This is something they had added. We're just talking about people who are adding. 613 of them. Yes. Okay, is, go ahead. This is after the uh, restoration of the second temple. Mm -hmm. That they added yeah. all these. Well, they wanted to make sure they did everything right, I guess. Okay. Jesus answered them answered, and why do you disobey God's command and follow your own teaching? For God said, respect your father and your mother, and whoever, cur and whoever curses his father or mother is to be put to death. But you teach that if a person has something he could use to help his father or mother, but says, this belongs to God, he does not need to honor his father in this way. His father. In this way, you disregard God's command in order to follow your own teaching. You hypocrites. How right Isaiah was when he prophesied about you. These people, says God, honor me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were my laws. Good News Bible. Okay, so what happened? They had added a whole bunch of rules that were not there. So well, we don't do that now. Us, of course not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which group of Jews do you think was farther from God's plans for their lives? The Old Testament people who are ignoring many of God's instructions or the New Testament Pharisees who are adding many things to God's instructions? Hmm. Bad question. No. The answer should be both. Both, yeah. yes, definitely. <laughs> the answer should be both. Are there some forces? Now, I don't think you have to think too hard to answer this question. Are there some forces in our church today that want to enforce more strict observant of all the, uh, observance of all the church doctrines and requirements, while others want to ignore many of what they regard as legalistic requirements? You Have aren't we ever... suggesting that actually happens, are you? Yeah. Hmm. What about parents that drive the kids out of the church? Yeah. Remember that while the children of Israel were camped on the plains across the flooded Jordan River from Jericho and Moses was writing out the book of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel were joining the nation of Midian in what turned out to be a fiasco. Deuteronomy 4, 3 and 4 from Good News Bible. You yourselves saw what the Lord did at Mount Peor. He destroyed everyone who worshipped Baal there. 
but those of you who were faithful to the Lord your God are still alive today. Do you remember the details of that story? Go ahead, Gordon, you can do that. Numbers 25, 1 through 18, Good News Bible. When the Israelites were camped in the valley of Acacia, the men began to have sexual intercourse with the Moabite women who were there. These women invited them to sacrificial feasts where the God of Moab was worshipped. The Israelites ate the food and worshipped the God Baal of Peor. So the Lord was angry with them and said to Moses, Take all the leaders of Israel and in obedience to me execute them in broad daylight. And then I will no longer be angry with the people. Okay, hold on a second. When we talk about the wrath of God, what are we, what, what are we talking about? Letting them go. Yeah, Romans 1, Romans 4, lots of other places in the Old Testament. God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from people who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So what are these people doing? They're out there attending the local theater. No, I mean, they're out there with the Midianite women, right? This was, this was the biggest and most exciting thing that was happening in the area, right? Did you know? Well, look what's going on out there. Well, better. But this is pretty active of God's instruction. In obedience to me, execute them. Yeah, well, go that, on. That's not passive. No, not we're passive in letting them go. Make another translation out of that. Yeah. Because the Bible has been edited to make God, as the Old Testament, to make God look really bad. Well, read the next sentence or two there and let's see what it says. Moses said to the officials, Each of you is to kill every man in your tribe who has become a worshiper of Baal of Peor. Now, why would God ask them to do that? Well, read on, we'll see what happens next. One of the Israelites took a Midianite woman into his tent in the sight of Moses and the whole community while they were mourning at the entrance of the, of the tent of the Lord's presence. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar and grandson of Aaron the priest saw this, he got up and left the assembly. He took a spear, followed the man and the woman into the tent and drove the spear through both of them. In this way, the epidemic that, ha that was destroying Israel was stopped, but it had already killed 24,000 people. So what okay. epidemic was that? Was that yeah. a sexually transmitted disease? It's no, I think rapidly... this, was a, this was an epidemic of God saying, these wicked people are going to completely destroy the nation unless you get rid of them. And this was people taking their swords and killing their brothers and their family members and so forth. So the epidemic was an epidemic of sin. Yes. Sin pays its wage. Mm-hmm death. Well, in the New Testament we read, be in the world but do not be a part of it. You yeah. see this going on again and again and yeah. again. Verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, because of what Phineas has done, I am no longer angry with the people of Israel. He refused to tolerate the worship of any god but me, and that is why I did not destroy them in my anger. Now let's think about this for a moment. I, I don't want to get too graphic here, but here's the people mourning. They're realizing what's happening out there as, as a bunch of people are dancing with these women and carrying on. And one of the leaders of the people, here he is with this Midianite woman. He walks right past all these people mourning. Moses. What's, huh? Moses is there. Yeah, yeah Moses is there. Yes. Yeah, he, and, and this, this leader of Israel walks right Past, leader, one of the tribes, walks right past the, the gathering group, the mourning group with this woman and into the tent. Well, okay, what is God going to do in a situation like that? Say, well, okay, it's up to lightning. him. Hmm? Lightning. Uh, lightning. lightning. <laughs> strike him. Well, he didn't, he said, I don't need to strike him with lightning right now. Here's somebody here with a spear. He'll do the job for me. I, I would, I hope that that had at least some impact on the people. I mean, how could you how could you not see what was going on? Verse 13 okay. again. He and his descendants are permanently established as priests.
because he did not tolerate any rivals to me and brought about forgiveness for the people's sins. Wow. The name of the Israelite who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Safu, or Salu, the head of the family in the tribe of Simeon. This, is a, this guy was a leader. The woman's name was Cosby Zur. Her father was chief of a group of Midianite clans. The Lord commanded Moses. So this is a way to get into the Bible. It was be extra evil. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Jezebel well, made it. The Lord commanded Moses, attack the Midianites and destroy them because of the evil they did to you when they deceived you at Peor and because of Cosby, who was killed at the time of the epidemic at Peor. At verse 16, the Lord commanded Moses. I remember we got Jeremiah 8, verse 8. The scribes say, oh, we've got the law, but their lying pen has made it into a lie. Mm -hmm. And here, what, all of this stuff that we're reading is hearsay. It would never stand up in a law court and so God has been accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Yeah. We've been but, over this many times and it's, yeah. it's very difficult to, to wrap our minds around it yeah. because we, we've been raised. Well, the Lord may have not commanded it, but he allowed it. And he, he, he had to allow it because of the situation. Uh, and to remind us of how corrupting pagan influences can be, we need to remember that the Midianites were descendants of Abraham. Right. Genesis 25, 1 and 2, I can read that for you. Abraham married another wife, this is after Sarah's death, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Median, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father and so forth and so forth. Um, well, that's a big, when he added to the sins of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> with those and and that, not only that, they were the in-laws of Moses. Yeah. yeah. Jethro was a Midianite. A priest of the Midianites. A priest of the Midianites, and a good priest in this case, which most of them weren't. What do you think Moses' wife thought as the children of Israel were instructed to kill the Midianites, her relatives? But God could not allow the children of Israel to be falling into pagan practices and idolatry if they were indeed going to be a witness to God, for God, to the nations around them. This was just the opposite of what they were supposed to be doing. God had to stop it at the outset. Some commentators would like to suggest that this was spiritual harlotry. Yes, were you going to comment? Yeah, I, uh, having a hard time fitting this picture of God that we have here with the picture that I have of God uh -huh. and trying to figure out how this all um, comes together. I've lost my... Well, let, let, me, let me pick your thought up a little uh, bit. Here, here's this probably a couple million people and 24,000 at least of them which is not a huge number, but it is a very significant number, are out there on the edge of the camp practicing these pagan religious fertility cult practices, including having sex with these Midianite women and so forth. They obviously were intended, I mean, they went out there specifically to, to, to cause this kind of re uh, response from the Israelites. That was their, that was their goal. Uh, what is God supposed to do? Pretend like it didn't happen? No, and it's not that God doesn't need to defend his, himself, but we, we say that the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. But is sin it? pays its wage, not God. Yeah. Yes. So, I've, is there possibly some other way that, I mean, did the people that were doing the killing of these 24,000, are they righteous because they killed these people? Or I Well, what God says, we read the verses, but we'll look at them again. What God says, you are still alive. So they were, <laughs> at least they were not dead. Listen up. <laughs> well, 
it's that that's that's what that's what God had to do with them under those circumstances. Verse nine that I read earlier, but it had already killed twenty four thousand people. It doesn't say that the Israelite leaders went out and killed twenty four thousand of the people. Well, but he had told them to do that. Yeah. yeah. Earlier. That's what was the text. it really twenty four thousand. Wow. Well. Go ahead. Let's. Well. Anyway. But the rest of the history of what happened to the children of Israel, especially in the northern kingdom, this is, of course, a thousand years later, tells us, or 800 years later, that tells us that this was literal prostitution and harlotry. Hosea 4, 12 to 14. They asked for revelations from a piece of wood. A stick tells them what they want to know. They have left me like a woman who becomes a prostitute. They have given themselves to other gods. At sacred places on the mountaintops, they offer sacrifices. And on the hills, they burn incense under tall spreading trees because the shade is so pleasant. As a result, your daughters serve as prostitutes and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. Yet I will not punish them for this because you yourselves go off with the temple prostitutes and together with them you offer pagan sacrifices as the Proverbs, as the Proverbs says, a people without sense will be ruined. Sin pays its wage. This, this God that we're talking about here, it was in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 4, it says, it was, Jesus was the same God mm -hmm. through the Old Testament, right? Yeah. We don't get any of this kind of stuff in the New Testament. No, they had a different kind of sin. Well, which was probably just as bad. Yeah, well, in fact, there's is there a hierarchy of sins? Not all that. Uh, but uh, the question I have is, why didn't Jesus spend uh, some time explaining when and the appropriate time and method to to kill people that that don't do things God's way? Mm -hmm. It says he came to, to reveal what the Father was like. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've accomplished the work you gave me to do, John 17, 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. uh, he, there's none of that in there. Why don't we learn to read the Bible from the prism, from the lens of the, of the Gospels, and then we find out, remember that passage from uh, uh, the Adventist Bible Commentary. God is attributed, uh, accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. And we also, in, G in Genesis, uh, what is it, it says, uh, take dominion. And it, does it God say, well, take dominion, but if you don't do it my way, look out, I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'm gonna zap you. It's not I, there. I, I, okay, but I, I will, we have the text. I understand. And we, we have, have to text. interpret the text. But when Jesus says, woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, and like you pointed out, hypocrites, Mm -hmm. And I and we got Jeremiah eight, but I, who had been studying this stuff for forty years, and about five years ago, uh, Roland Zimmerman pointed that text out to me, Jeremiah eight verse eight, mm -hmm. uh, and then I found out sometime after that another friend of ours pointed it out to him, and we don't deal with that that passage, mm -hmm. and I, I think we end up with a false concept of the Creator. At the beginning of Israel's sojourn in the wilderness, even at the foot of Mount Sinai, they had become involved in sexual immorality and worshiping a golden calf, Exodus 32. You think that they weren't doing that when Jesus was here? <laughs> well, it change, not, it doesn't change a whole lot. Not openly, because the Pharisees would have turned blue. I mean, they would have, they would have executed them on the spot. They weren't literally worshiping the golden calf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they were maybe doing everything else, but... So at the end, the very end of those 40 years, they had done basically the same thing we just read in, November, in Numbers 25. By adopting pagan practices and getting involved in immoral so-called worship ceremonies. Doesn't it seem like after 40 years of instruction from Moses and guidance from God, they would have learned not to make this kind of mistake? How could it happen? Could it happen in our day? What would be a modern equivalent? Our world is steeped in immorality and anti-Christian ideas and practices. Would it be possible for us to be influenced by some of those ideas and practices to corrupt our religion today? What would Satan be? Uh, uh, what would Satan love more than that? Ken, 
Yeah. You passed right over what would be a modern equivalent. Yes. I didn't hear anyone propose an answer to that. Okay. Including you. Okay. Can you propose? Do we see anything going on around us that's just permeated with immorality? All over the place. Movies, the television, the, you know, the nightclubs and so forth. I mean, you know, how is that different? How is it that God has to keep leveling the playing field? Mm -hmm. That the devil's, Satan's attractiveness to us poor human beings is so great that we can't. You mean sinners, as sinners we love sin? Yeah. I saw an article in one of today's newspapers mm -hmm. <laughs> dealing with the church here. They're having a, a concert on Saturday night. Tickets will be 10 or $50, I think it was. And it didn't look like it was any of our people. I don't know, but there's going to be some bebop going out there. Yeah. Religious stuff, supposedly, but is it? I don't know. I've never seen anything listed like that before here. Well, about 24,000 people died as a result of that apostasy just before they entered the Promised Land. It is hard for us to imagine, however, the children of Israel that remained faithful to God were specifically told to go to their relatives and friends, those who had become involved in this pagan idolatry, and kill them. It does not seem right to us. Well, what words do we have? Deuteronomy 4, 4, but those of you who are faithful to the Lord your God are still alive. And Deuteronomy 4, 4 from the King James Version, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. That's King James. So what is this about cleaving? It specifically talks about the men who were killed because they were involved in this, these sexual practices. What happened to their wives and children? I mean, if you stop and back up a little bit and think about it, there were no middle ground, and there was no middle ground in this situation. It is hard for us to imagine even burying twenty-four thousand bodies under those circumstances. Should we go over there on the plains of Moab and start digging around to see if we can find some bones? Matthew twelve. By the way, I just read uh, not today. I just heard on YouTube today they've just made another discovery of um, in, in the city of David in Jerusalem. They've dug up and they found what is almost certainly a whole layer of civilization that was destroyed by the earthquake that talk, it talks about in Amos and, and Zechariah in the Old Testament. And nobody, you know, no other records for that earthquake. And nobody said, well, okay. Now we know that Israel is right on earthquake fault. You know, the great Rift Valley and so forth there. But now they have found and they're pretty sure it was an earthquake because there's a lot of damage. But when, 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 an arm, when an army comes through and attacks, they usually burn everything when they're done. So there's no chance for, there's no sign of any burning or anything else like that. It's just a layer of, of just total destruction. Anyway, the Hebrew word for did cleave, dubuk, often points to a strong commitment to adhere to something outside of oneself. The same Hebrew word, word root is used in Genesis 2.24, when a man shall leave his father and cleave unto his wife, see also Ruth 1.4.14. It, in this context, appears four more times in Deuteronomy 10.20, 11.22, 13.4, and 30.20. And in each case, the idea was the same. They, the people, were to cleave or cling to their God. That is, they were to give themselves to him and to draw power and strength from him. And that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Um, Genesis 2.24, who's next? Jim, I think that's yours. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and he is united with his wife and they become one. Good News Bible, Ruth 1.14. Again, they started crying. Then Oprah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and went back home. But Ruth held on to her. So you can recognize that that word, Ruth held on to her. That's the, the same Hebrew word. 
Deuteronomy 13.4 Follow the Lord and honor Him. Obey Him and keep His commands. Worship Him and be faithful to Him. Deuteronomy 10.20 Obey the Lord your God and worship only Him. Be faithful to Him and make your promise in His name alone. Deuteronomy 11.22 Obey faithfully all the laws that I have given you. Love the Lord your God, do everything he commands, and be faithful to him. Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. Love the Lord your God, obey him, and be faithful to him, and then you and your descendants will live long in the land that he promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All from the okay. Good News Bible. Be faithful to him, cleave to him, you know, hang on to him, don't let go. Notice a very important point that God gives instructions. He gives clear guidance, but we must do the cleaving or the clinging to him. God refuses to use force on anyone. His kingdom is the kingdom of love, and love cannot be forced. Carrie, what can you tell us about that? The earth was dark through misapprehension of God that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. <clears throat> okay, we've got the whole great controversy basically just spelled out there in a few sentences, haven't we? Yeah. God's side is love. Satan's side is selfishness and self-exaltation. Self so... This work, only one being, and that's in capital letters, in all of the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the sun of righteousness must rise. And in, in quotes, with healing in his wings. And that's from Malachi 4.2. And from uh, Ellen G. White's Desire of Ages, page 21. Paragraph one, 22. 22 uh, paragraph. And this is like the first page of her book on Desire of Ages, The Story of the Life of Christ. And right up front, she says the center core, the core idea of his coming to this earth is to deal with what? The issues in the great controversy. Are we going to do it God's way or are we going to do it Satan's way? And God's way never involves what? Force. Force. You mean we say that God doesn't win through intimidation? Why would he do that? No, of course not. I mean, it's just, uh, but many times people, are, the texts are written in such a way that it makes God look like he is intimidating. God is not, yeah. Go ahead, are we going to comment? So God inspired the scriptures, presumably the ones that we have. He preserved them through all the ages. We've uh, Ken has, has a whole series on, on the preservation of the Bible and so on. And uh, so don't you think that God looked out for how he was viewed? Well, what do we do? I, I have over a thousand different English trans, er, translations of the Bible in English. Now, that's not or all portions. completely Bible. Yeah. Right. Okay. Be, be honest. But... Uh, I'll use an example, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 25 and 26. The 1984 edition says, I gave them over to laws the way by which they could not have life. They caused their firstborn to go through the fire. I did this and I might horrify them. The RSV says, I gave them laws by which they could not have life. I caused their firstborn to go through the fire. Then in 19, excuse me, 2011, the NIV, which I mentioned first, they changed it to be just like the King James and the um, uh, and, and, excuse me, the King James and the RSV. So where does the truth lie? One six text says just the opposite. Uh, in fact, you go to the King James in the same Bible uh, uh, where it says, "I gave them laws." 
you go to uh, Jeremiah 19, 5, uh, 7, 31, and 20, 34, 35, I think it is. Anyway, I never, it, that idea never even came to my mind. That in the same translation. Why do we have such opposites? We, very quick questions. Then. Um, did the Dead Sea Scroll include this text? Yes. Uh, okay, so can we trust the Dead Well, Sea okay. Here's the answer to that, to Jim's comment, basically. God expects us to read all of Scripture. We should not base our whole theory on one verse here, or one verse there, or even two or three verses. If you read it all and you put it all together, you say, well, then you will, and then you accommodate for places like where it doesn't seem to. Say. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It means that there are reasons why God did what He did at that point, or there's a reason why God allowed what He allowed at that point, and that's that's why we read all the Bible and not just one part of it. No, I, I like what you just said. Still, uh, can we sometimes take a look at this text then, uh, what the yeah. uh, Dead Sea Scroll says, and maybe let's go from there. Uh, well, yeah. is, there's many passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls or in the Septuagint, which was uh, about the same time as what the Te Dead Sea Scrolls, and you get a better translation than you do from what generally most people read is a Masoretic text, which is from a thousand years later. But, but look, can we go back to the Dead Sea Scroll and really truly look at it as the most authentic that we can ever get our hands on? Yes, you no. You well, still got the text, the scribes have made it into a lie. I really don't care. I mean, what well, can we go into the Dead Sea Scroll? Can we look at that and say well, this you is... Can, you can, I have a Dead Sea Scrolls Bible at home. And it's... Uh, Jim, I, I hope this makes sense to you. Oh, I do. I have the same thing that Ken has. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, well, I'd, be gl I'd gladly take a look at it sometimes. Yeah. But what you said, though, is to me is vitally important. Let us take a look at the big picture. Yeah. And let's... And what, let's and what did Jesus say in Matthew 23? Starting at verse 13 and following, he says, Woe well, unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Okay? Whoever the scribes? The scribes yeah, are the ones that are trans. So, so, no doubt about that. You we, we need hypocrites, are you? No, I see. He was, no, point, I'm glad that Ken pointed it out a few, a few weeks ago. He was calling the scribes and the Pharisees the hypocrites. This, especially well, this we're not we Pharisees. Are, we are, no, I'm not talking. I'm not beating up on our friends here. Uh, <laughs> you very, should be. <laughs> Why? We're, we're stall struggling. Um, it's it's really really truly interesting to see how Satan has used his techniques throughout <sighs> the ages. Okay, look in the Old Testament. A harsh picture of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, all these laws. Mm -hmm. Now, no laws. 43,000 denominations, once you accept God, Christ, you cannot be unaccepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can do, go do anything you want to. I hope it never permeates into Adventism. So I, I deal with, I, I'm, yeah. I'm constantly with this folk. Charles, I'm saved. I'm once saved. I cannot be unsaved. These are very educated people. You, you, really, deal, educated people. you deal with a lot of Muslims. Over there. Yes, have I you not? I'm okay. About okay. And in the the Islam or the uh, what do they call the Quran? Yes. I think right about the second verse of the first part of the of their book says this per, this book is perfect. There's no error in it. Right. Right in the middle of uh, the the our Bible, Jeremiah eight verse eight says the scribes have made it into a lie. And I quoted that passage to a, a, a Muslim guy who was up in the north part of San Bernardino, and because uh, my son was ma manufacturing some stuff for the guy, and he picked up on that. <laughs> but what? Listen, you know, God, God is this. Come now, let us reason together. Yeah. Okay. God is not uh, have insecure. Well, God is not asking us to fight the devil in our own strength. The New Testament promises help. Jude 24. Kerry? To him who is able to keep you from falling and to bring you faultless and joyful before his glorious presence. And that's from the Good News Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. 
At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. That's from the Good News Bible. God, God may provide help in strange and unexpected ways, but we need to do the choosing. That's what we can do. We can choose. We need to do that, do the committing to his ways. No temptation should overpower us. So how can we be helped by prayer, Bible study, witnessing, worship, and fellowship with other Christians? Aren't those the ways we get to know God better? We come together like this and we discuss the scriptures. And Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 to 10, we have some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. Moses was trying to convince the children of Israel why it was so important for them to obey God. He told them what God wanted them to do. And then he told them why God is so powerful and that they, so, and that they could depend upon him. He reminded them of the ways that God had led them in the past. Charles? Yes, sir, in Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 10, I have taught you all these laws. As the Lord, my God, told me to you, this is Moses speaking to the Israelites, mm -hmm. obey them in the land that you are about to invade and occupy. Obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. When they hear all of these laws, they will say, what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. I, I cannot help it but make yeah. a statement. I do travel quite a bit and uh, speak with Muslims. And when they found out who Seventh-day Adventists are, they'll say, wow, you're a better Muslim than I am. Mm -hmm. I have a, a friend who is a neurologist from Pakistan. He was uh, president of um, a mosque, 7,000 members mosque okay, in the Midwest. And he would never tell any of his friends that I'm a Christian. He will always say, meet Charles, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He says, when they hear all these laws, they will say, what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. Yeah. We have a beautiful message as Seventh-day Adventists, mm -hmm. you know, to share with the world. No other nation, no matter how great, has a God who is so near when they need him as the Lord, our God, is to us. He answers us whenever we call for help. No other nation, no matter how great, has laws so just those that I have taught you today. Be on your guard. Make certain that you do not forget. As long as you live, what you have seen with your own uh, eyes, tell your children, your grandchildren, about the day you stood in the presence of the Lord your God at Mount Sinai when he said to me, assemble the people, I want them to hear what I have to say so that they will learn to obey me as long as they live and so that they will teach their children to do the same. Good news Bible. Now here's a, if you read between the lines here, this is very interesting. God says, look, you have seen so many other nations claiming that chunks of wood, chunks of stone, chunks of metal are gods. Okay, let me, wa let me show you what I do. Mm. And I want you to, now, I, God could come down every few minutes and gazap a bunch of people or, or, you know, make a big display of some kind or whatever so that we would constantly live in fear. But that's not the way God wants it to be done. He says, Remember what happened there. Mm -hmm. I did this one time, and that was important. You needed to see that I was more powerful than those so-called so gods in Egypt. And I wanted you to know that I had the power to take you out of Egypt. I had the power to assemble you at the bottom of that mountain. And then I wanted to show you, I made the universe. Shaking a mountain is nothing for me. Mm -hmm. You need to remember that. So God wanted Israel to remember that they had been called and chosen and God had gone to extraordinary lengths, including the plagues on Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the giving of the Ten Commandments, etc., to bring them out and take them into the Promised Land. It was time for them to trust in His power and enter the land following His guidance. 
Remember that this land had been promised to Abraham and his, his descendants 400 years earlier. Genesis 18:18. 18, 18. His descendants will become a great and mighty nation, and through him I will bless all nations. Mm. Good News Bible. But making the Israelites into a great nation was not just so they could enjoy those privileges, they were to be examples to who? Oh. To all the world. Gordon? From uh, the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. But the purpose of making them great was that they could be a blessing, Genesis 12, 2, to all the families of the earth, Genesis 12, 3. And though the ultimate blessing would be that Jesus, the Messiah, would come through their bloodline, until then they were, in, they were to be the light of the world. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth, Isaiah 49, 6. Not that salvation was found in them, but that through them the true God, who alone can save, was to be revealed. Israel was worshiping and serving the God who created the cosmos, the Lord of heaven and earth. The pagans were worshiping rocks, stones, woods, wood, and demons from Deuteronomy 20, uh, pardon me, 32, 17, and Psalms 106, 37. What a stark difference. Wow. Now, I, I don't know, but if, if you were a child, and you had gone through that experience at the foot of Mount Sinai, and then you came later in life, and you, after they've gone into the country, of the, into the territory of Palestine, and some of those foreign children came around and said, our gods, look at them, aren't they pretty? And you would say, mm. let me tell you what our God does. Mm -hmm. What a contrast. God was begging them to take him seriously. Deuteronomy 4, 32 to 35, search the past, the time before you were born, all the way back to the time when God created humanity on the earth. Search the entire earth. Has anything as great as this ever happened before? Has anyone ever heard of anything like this? Have any people ever lived after hearing a God speak to them from a fire as you have? Has any God, I, I'm just thinking of the story of, of, of uh, Elijah, uh, call quick, you know, Mount Carmel. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's sleeping. W wake him up. See if this guy of yours can do anything, you know? Has any God ever dared to go and take a people from another nation and make them his own as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt? Before your very eyes, he used the great his great power and strength. He brought plagues and war, worked miracles and wonders, and caused terrifying things to happen. The Lord has shown you this to prove to you that he alone is God and there is no other. And remember these words, Deuteronomy 4, 6 and 7. <clears throat> Obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. We just, this is a repetition of what we just read. When they hear of all these laws, they will say, what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. No other nation, no matter how great, has a God who is so near when they need him as the Lord our God is to us. He answers us whenever we call for help. To us. So many centuries, even millennia later, reading these passages, we might get the idea that it's God's statutes and judgments that are full of wisdom and understanding. But in the direct instructions from God, it was to, to be Israel following the laws of God, which would prove how wise they were. So it's not just something written down in a book, as important that, as that is, and not just something spoken from a mountain, as God did. It's something lived out in the lives of his followers that is important. Other nations would say what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. And despite the fact that the other nations were supposed to see this wisdom and understanding the behavior of the Israelites themselves, those other nations were supposed to recognize that it was because they were following God's instructions and depending upon his power. 
Unfortunately, even in their conquest of the land, they insisted on doing it their way. If we had it, we should take a whole section, a whole session, maybe two or three sessions, and compare God's original instructions about how they were supposed to go into the land back in Exodus 23, and I would encourage you to go back and read what God said about how they were supposed to conquer the land, really how he was going to conquer the land for them, and compare Deuteronomy 20, verse 16, which, in following which we're going to come to in a few weeks. They didn't want to do it that way. We want, we want to go in, we want to kill our enemies with our own swords and our own spears, and then we can claim to be the ones who conquered the land. Uh, we, we, we don't need God to do it for us. We wouldn't want God to get the credit, right? Well, as the song go, I did it my way. Yeah. Is today, there something today that we are trying to do for ourselves instead of giving God the credit? Hmm. Did that happen in our day? No. <laughs> Today, could we gain wisdom and understanding by, carefully observe, by careful observance of God's directions and instructions? Jim, I think that's yours. Their obedience to the law of God would make them marvels of prosperity before the nations of the world. He, would, he could give them wisdom and skill in all cunning, excuse me, all cunning work would continue to be their teacher and would ennoble and elevate them through the obedience to his laws. If obedient, they would be preserved, with the preserved from the diseases that afflicted other nations and would be blessed with vigor and intellect. The glory of God, his majesty and power were to be revealed all in their prosperity. In were, all their prosperity. In all their prosperity. They were to be given, excuse me, they were to be a kingdom of priests and princes God furnished them with every facility for becoming the greatest nation on the earth. Ellen White, Christ Albic Lessons, page 288. Wow. Jesus himself said that people were supposed to see our good works and glorify God. How does that work, Kerry? Reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are like the salt for the whole human race. And if salt loses its saltiness, there is no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on the lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. <clears throat> do we do good things so that people say Seventh-day Adventists are a great church? Or, or to say that, you, hey, you got a great God. Yeah, mm -hmm. where, when, do, when does that happen? Has it ever happened? <laughs> Can you remember? <laughs> this whole sequence of events was part of the much larger great controversy which Satan has done everything possible to overthrow the government of God. Charles? From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered uh, purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he had continued the same warfare upon the earth to deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law. Is, is this the object which he has steadfastly pursued? whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of the principles, the result will ultimately be the same. He has offered in one point manifest... He that offends. He that offends in one point manifest contempt for the whole law. His influence and example at this, uh, are on the side of transgression. He becomes guilty of all. James 2.10 and that's from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 582, paragraph 1. Notice how Ellen White described what happened at Baal Peor. These are her words. 
Myra? They, ven they ventured upon the forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan, beguiled with music and dancing and alluring of the beauty of the heathen vestals. They cast off their fealty to Jehovah. I don't know that word. Fealty, that means faithfulness to Jehovah. Oh, okay. As they united in mirth and fasting, Feasting. 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 Excuse me, not fasting. Feasting. Indulgence in wine beclouded their senses and broke down the barriers of self-control. Passion had full sway, and having beguiled, defiled their consciences, consciences right. by lewd, lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. They offered sacrifice to heathen altars and participated in the most degrading rites. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 454, page Wow. So how are we responding to God's instructions to us? Are we facing up to the time of transition at the second coming of Jesus Christ? Think about all the instructions and help that we as a church have been given. Are we studying those instructions and following them? Do you think you'd be willing to take a sword or even a gun and kill other people who have been disobeying God if you were instructed to do so by God? Some think they have gotten that instruction. Yep. Carrie has taken care of a lot of those people. <laughs> not I've not with a gun or a sword. <laughs> no, no, but uh, you, yeah, yeah, people that are In disturbed mentally. Okay, we're running out of time, but go ahead and start our next you section. you want me to read this? We'll start and we'll... Stop when we need to. What makes a nation great is generally what it achieves. Its political power, the surface of its land, the exploits in war, or its wealth. Nothing of the, that sort characterizes the nation of Israel when the people hear Moses' compliment, Moses' rhetorical question, what other nation is so great, Deuteronomy 4.8, implies that this is the greatest nation on earth. The people of former slaves, of homeless migrants, hardly fit the definition of a great nation. What makes Israel so great is not what it did or did not do. It is not who the nation is or is not. It is God. And we're running out of time there, but you can see that, and if you get our handouts, you can read the rest of it here. It's available on our website at theox.org. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have spread out before us on the pages of Scripture these incredible words. Some of them are a challenge, as we've, already, as we've seen in our lesson today. Some of them we might question, but if we read all of it and we compare it page with page and idea with idea and we, we get the total picture, we will have a picture that is wonderful, a picture that is a true picture of you. But of course, our human minds and our human words can't begin to fully comprehend what you're like. We look forward to that day soon when we may be able to enter into the full fellowship with you in the kingdom and be able to say, this is our God. We have seen him, we have beheld him, and we have become like him. May that day be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.